Lovely looking pass, Stanway! <laughs> FA Cup winners for the third time in four years. Okay, good evening everyone um, and welcome to the fourth and final in uh, the Women's FA Cup final webinar series. Um, first we looked at practice design in possession, um, then we looked at practice design out of possession um, and we looked at Esme Morgan's um, playground to Wembley um, journey and now we're going to look at um, the match day to the training pitch. We're going to review um, the FA Cup final. Um, I'm joined tonight by Mark Swales, um, women's national coach developer, and Jenna Burke Mine, um, women's high performance football centre coach development officer. Good evening, all. Hi, everybody. As advertised, we were meant to have Richard Meek. Um, he is trying diligently in the background to try and get in. Tech is not on his side, so we're going to, um, if he can join us at any point, we'll get him in straight away. So, Tonight, we're going to look at the key storylines of the FA Cup final, where the game was only won. Then we'll look at some of the, the challenges that our coaches face, especially when taking information and trying to deliver insight to their players. Um, and then we'll look at what are the implications of this on practice design and ultimately where um, coaches spend their time trying to make their players better. So to kick things off, uh, we've got to watch some football. So we're going to play a video um, and look at uh, some of the highlights from the, the Women's FA Cup final. All the players, the officials, and the two benches take a knee to send out football's continuing powerful message, no room for racism. So the 50th Women's FA Cup final is underway at Wembley, hosting this fixture for only the sixth time, and both teams looking to win the competition for the third time. Adjustment. Found it was the medal down the right sock. Cup in hand. FA Cup winners for the third time in four years. Congratulations, Manchester City. Oh, 
Okay, so it, it was a final 441 days in the making. <laughs> I never thought we'd say that. Mm -hmm. Several lockdowns, um, several transfer windows, um, and, and it was a, a very interesting final. So there's, there's some base statistics there, um, Mark, um, that, that we've sort of populated from the final. Yeah, no, thanks, Matt. I think, first of all, I mean, Jenna, I'm sure you agree, and I've watched this game back now three, four times in preparation for this evening, and every time I've watched it, there's been little bits that have really stuck out. But, you know, statistics don't always <clears throat> tell the whole story, but I think, you know, looking at some of the stats here around possession and, and shots, I think it really does show what a gritty, determinated sort of game it was and how much Manchester United maybe... Manchester City, sorry, dominated possession. <laughs> um, but how much effort Everton put into trying to delay and, and stop them from scoring goals? When you look at the, the difference between shots on target to actual shots, it, it shows that there was a clear, clear sort of tactic in terms of how they played. And I know we're going to unpick a little bit around the low blocking emergency defending later on. Um, but also when we look at the corners, and again, some statistics that we're going to unpick shortly how important now within the women's game at the highest level that set plays are yeah so some uh, bespoke analysis we did on, on last season in WSL um, showed that 28% of goals 72 um, in total uh, come from set plays um, so that just highlights that a third of a third of goals are coming from these um, instances and, and that was really evident on, on Sunday in the final yeah, and I think, again, you know, it's it's one of those things that as the game progresses and, and teams work harder in their defensive strategies, that set plays are going to become even more important at this stage. So if you just move on into the teams, um, Jenna, I'm going to come to you. And there's a, an interesting final. So Chloe Kelly starts, uh, starts the FA Cup campaign at Everton. Um, there was a ruling that allowed six players... Um, so the first six signings could play in the, in the new season and, and obviously Chloe Kelly was one of them. So coming up against uh, her old teammates. Any individual battles that, that stood out for you in the game, Jenna? Um, yeah, I think there was some some interesting stuff. So from the, the full-backs pushing on, um, Steph Horton driving in centrally, something that we'll look at a little bit later on. Um, but some really interesting overloads created from players moving on through thirds of the, the pitch. Uh, and just on that, Matt, I don't think we can not have that discussion about the teams and not actually talk about the two goalkeepers. Yeah, 100%. Um, I've actually got a nice nice photo. So Sandy, Sandy McIver, um, player of the match, um, and quite rightly so, some, some outstanding saves to, to keep everything in the game and, and progress it to, to extra time. Um, we alluded to in, our, in, the, in the previous webinars about the importance of that first goal um, and that first goal pat particularly being in the first half, um, which the, the final uh, fit that trend. However, it was later on, it wasn't uh, within the first 15 minutes. Um, so we actually saw a more a cagey game, as you've already alluded to, Mark. Yeah, and again, I think it just shows and highlights that you know, statistics that we've looked at have, have shown within the final that scoring the first goal in, in any game is really important. And doesn't matter whether it's in the first half or second half, but the momentum that's gained by scoring that goal can have a, a massive impact on what happens next. And then, you know, leading into where we're going to go with this in terms of the coach's role as well, that once that goal has been scored, what, what impact the coach can have on the game after that moment. Um, and yeah, whilst it wasn't in the first half, certainly once the goal was scored, it, it certainly changed the dynamics of how both teams had to play. I'm just going to come over to you, Jenna, in terms of the, the role of the coach on the match day um, and how and how that sort of evolves. So we've, got, we've got a picture of Gareth Taylor there with his, his coaching staff. Yeah, the, the coach's role, um, once the players get on the pitch, can be really limited on how much they can impact the game. Um, but we see in one of the clips later, Gareth Taylor directing players to do something a little bit different that ultimately um, creates some opportunities further up the pitch. Um, their, their role is to mainly motivate on there and how they have a positive impact on the game, how they can do that. Um, and thinking about... Um, how you become a role model for your players. So your behaviour on the side of the pitch 
be then taken on by your players and um, almost by the players on the pitch. So being aware of of that impact that you can have on players while the game's going on as well. I think, Jenna, on that, the two of them are great examples for their clubs, aren't they? And the way that they present themselves in terms of their body language and the way that they articulate themselves from what we can see. And Matt, I think you did a great job, a little bit of lip reading earlier on today when we started talking about this, didn't you, in terms of just the messages that they're trying to send. And OK, we appreciate that an empty Wembley is a very different story in terms of trying to get your messages across without 50, 60, 80,000 fans screaming. Um, but for the coaches that are watching this, again, it's something that we, we need to consider. And, you know, if we if we flick on to the next slide, Matt, the and we talked about this when we interviewed Esme and, and she brought a lot of these these words up. And and again, whether it's match day or training, how you present yourself as a coach, as a manager is, is vital to the way that your players will interact with you on game day. And that really positive mindset and that really motivational um, approach can can have a massive impact on how the game goes. I want to give uh, equality with the forward. So we've got one of Gareth Taylor, one of Willie Kirk. Um, and it was, it was really clear, wasn't it, that the players gave absolutely everything uh, everything for them, their teammates and, and the group. Generally. Yeah, and I, and I think what to say on that as well, Matt, is that I think you can see Willie smiling there in terms of that, even that, just that showing that confidence and self-awareness of how important body language is, especially in a cup final where players are going to be nervous, they're going to be, you know, challenged by the the, the nerves of trying to win an FA Cup final. Yeah. The, the knowing your players bit on there is um, is a really key one. So knowing how you interact with your players on game day, who can take the directness of an instruction and who actually would find that um, demotivating and more of a criticism. So knowing your players and how to deal with them on a match day, whether you talk to them in the changing rooms in front of everyone at half time or whether you might have to pull them on the walk into the changing rooms, that kind of stuff is really important that is built in training but also used on a match day. And it's how you have those interactions with players. For sure. And then we're just going to uh, bring it on now into the impact of the substitutions um, in terms of tactic strategies. Um, so that's something we can sort of measure in terms of the, the impact um, post-change of, of how it changes the momentum. What was your observations, Jenna, from, from the final in terms of, um, we're looking at Man City in this aspect in terms of their substitutions? Yeah, um, Georgia Stanway is obviously a big one that came on, scored a goal um, and then set up the final goal as well um, to be scored, playing the ball through into into lane two in the pitch. So she had a massive impact in terms of finishing off that game in extra time. Um, and what a sub to bring on after three minutes to bring on an in England international um, with fresh legs after 60 minutes is a, is a massive impact on the game. Jenna, do you think that was planned or do you think it was the moment in the game that sort of decided that Stanway was the right player to bring on that point? Yeah, I think when you've got um, a squad such as Man, Man City have, um, to bring on players like that obviously has a massive impact on the game and then the opposition have to try and deal with that as, as they come on as well, hmm. um, as well as being fatigued at that point in the game. Um, yeah. But yeah, a, a game plan where you're able to bring on players like that from your squad depth is um, hmm. a real key key opportunity for Gareth to to put on there. Yeah, and I think you know what we talked about earlier on, didn't we, Matt and Jenna, was the fact that the state of the game in that moment, and, and the fact that it was still quite open and it was still there for both teams to win. And if it had been slightly different, in, in, let's say Manchester City were two 0 up, then. Actually, maybe it might not have been Stan when it came on first. And if you think Jill Scott was sat on the bench, someone that's played over, I think, 100, nearly 150 games now for England, that actually that type of player would have been the sort of player that might have came on if it was 2-0 or 3-0 to Man City at that point. And it's again, comes back to that point of understanding your players and understanding which players can offer you what at the right time in the right moment of the game. For sure. And there's a great question. Richard Finch is asking a chat about how many subs were allowed. Um, Everton made four, so they were allowed an additional one as he went into extra time. Um, so Man City actually had a wealth of resource on the bench and, and didn't uh, didn't use an extra sub. So they were actually, um, you could argue, they, they planned as individuals that are looking to, to change the game. Um, and they didn't need to make additional subs. 
And I think as as we know, you know, looking forward into the next part is, you know, what impact Stanway and Park both had in in the actual ultimate ultimate result. And obviously Becky coming on as well, that all of them had a massive influence on the final outcome of the game. Cool. So back back to the football. Uh, that was enough. <laughs> enough talking about it. So um, we've got some 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 video um, without some graphics on. So we're just um, going to encourage you to to watch this um, and and note in the chat um, what your observations are in terms of how Man City look to create goal scoring opportunities. Exactly as Mark says in the chat, tell us what you see, what are your observations on what you're watching. Well, we're going to talk through them, so it'll be interesting to see in a minute if people are picking out the same sort of things that, you know, where we've taken it. And again, you know, you picked out Matt, of four or five clips here, but what was interesting that we could have quite easily gone down a very different direction in terms of some of the, the creating opportunities and, and where we could have taken this. Good, so Chris is on the right direction like that. Chris, well done. So yeah, I've done it in time order, um, making runs into space. That sort of, that sort of link. Um, so just, just as we as we talk, um, we're going to revisit this. So just keep uh, keep populating, and we'll we'll look to pick up some of the discussion about that. So wing play, um, running into space, creating space. So we presented this on the last um, webinar in terms of this is taken from the WSL study that I mentioned. So this is analysing all goals scored, um, and it showed that. The location of the goals being central. Um, so if you jump the pitch into five lanes, like the England DNA, um, then 86% of the goals come from the, the central lane, so lane three. Um, and actually, if you look at the assists in terms of the build-up for the goals, um, they, they typically come through the central um, areas or through them half spaces. Um, so it was very much tapping into this wing play that's been mentioned um, and, and actually looking at how the teams um, connect and combine to get into those advanced areas of the pitch. And I think to add to that sort of map in terms of going back to the previous webinars that present around goal scoring, again, it comes back to realistic practice and 86% is a, is a huge number. And, you know, how much of our time do we actually spend in lane three in terms of making sure that we, we get the ball, you know, even the assists from lane three as well. How much time do we spend more time actually with the assists coming from lanes four and five or one and two than actually getting that ball? 25% is still coming through the middle. Exactly, exactly. So now um, carry on um, the discussion. We've got, uh, so we've alluded to lanes two and four, so the half spaces um, down the sides. Um, we're now going to play some clips. We're going to talk through this. So this will be a, a longer piece of about you had in Man City only get success within the, the FA Cup final yeah. using this strategy. Yeah. And I think just to add to this as well, what you're going to see very early on is, again, how some of the information that Gareth was obviously, and this was the bit where you did a brilliant lip reading job, wasn't it? In terms of the information he was sharing at times was very much what someone put in the chat around getting Steph or Greenwood to actually drive through the middle and compete can commit players in it to actually break lines. Yeah. Um, and the first hip really shows this about how all of a sudden we've taken four or five players out of the game and we're in a position where we're really couldn't attack. Yeah. Yeah, so I think it was uh, just from my lip reading, um, <laughs> I think it was just to, to take the pressure away. Um, so Everton were pressing with a with long lone striker and um, it was almost to just beat that first line by dribbling um, rather than making passes and, and, and making passes higher up the pitch, which I, I know is something, Jenna, that you spoke about, um, creating overloads higher up the pitch earlier. So again, the clips are in, they're in, in time order so we can get a feel for the game. Um, just look at some of the combinations. It's more about the intention, isn't it? So what's their intention? Yeah. 
And they look so again, a couple of people have put in the chat already about the four runs and the movements, and, and it's what we're going to look at now when we look at the practice design of how how all of a sudden players are bursting into lane two and two and four to to create you know opportunities to to get the ball in and around the penalty area. And again, at this point, I think in the game, in terms of Everton, in terms of things that we're going to touch on, in terms of the the um, the low block and the emergence de defending, as the game did progress, they did drop deeper and deeper, which, and again, I think this is the goal, isn't it? I think, you know, made it harder for, for Man City to run in behind, but they still managed to get into those lanes two and four. Yeah, I think this clip's great, isn't it? The first, the first instance was blocked. Um, Doggy defending from Everton, but they actually Man City keep keep that momentum, keep keep the ball, and search for that next opportunity. Um, yeah. they, they get the perfect one down the side. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, just just picking up on Colin's point. Evening, Colin. Um, I understand what you're saying. I think, like you say, and the things that we're going to touch on in a moment in terms of the four runs of both Weir and Mewis are really crucial here. That sort of central midfielder. Um, making that important run or the wingers coming inside to to really make sure that they the ball was transferring from one area to another area but through the middle rather than um, it coming from wide areas for sure and the, the stats that I presented before were from the wider study um, in terms of WSL so that was a league a league um, general this is taken from Man City um, so this is Man City last season. Um, it shows where they score their goals, that importance of the second six-yard box. Um, they only lost one game um, when they scored first. So really, really dominant um, when they get that first goal and they can manage the game. And actually, if we look at then where they create their chances from, um, lane two, really evident. Um, and actually that, that wider link, wing play in, in lane four and five, looking to progress. Mm -hmm. uh, looking to progress centrally so actually score centrally but build up through the wings yeah and that's probably to do with again the, the type of player that they have and the fact that lucy bronze will often um probably get forward more and it is as much as an exciting attacking fullback as a as she's a, an outstanding defensive fullback for sure and then my question was going to be in terms of actually so we've got we've got all this information it's great but actually, what's meaningful for the players? What would you tell them when? Um, and it's back to that role of the coach, isn't it, Jenna, that we, we spoke about before? And, and actually, when when's the right time to deliver this information to them? Yeah, definitely. When do, when do they take it on? And actually, how do they learn as well? So will the players get more from being on the pitch or will they get more from seeing analysis sessions that you do and revisit it, revisiting it or on the training pitch? What does that look like? Um, and how you do it based on individual players' learning styles and their needs. Yeah, so we had a go at this, didn't we, Mark? <laughs> or you did. Um, so we watched the game. Um, we saw this was a real evident uh, strategy. Um, we've highlighted some clips, and then we'll link that into practice design to try and simulate um, how, we, how we piece all this together. Yeah. Uh, I'll play the video first. So this is this is if you were if you're a Man City women's manager, Mark, um, this is what you'd be highlighting. Yeah, and I, and I think it's it's good to say at this point is that when when you look at the whole club's philosophy, there's obviously a, definitely a a connection between what the men and the women are doing, and and the type of movements and the, the areas that they're trying to to play into are really evident in both teams. So again, here we're just looking to highlight, and, and again, a lot of you have touched on it in the chat around the, the movements and the forward runs and that willingness of the, the central midfielders to really drive into spaces to, to break lines beyond the back four. And again, okay, that one wasn't successful, but the intent to get there was was really, really good. And again, here, you know, the, the drive and, the, and the, the intensity for, for them to, to get into that lane twos and in and around the box is, is creating more and more opportunities for them to to get shots off on goal 
And again, very unlucky. And again, what an amazing save that was to, to keep that one out. But the intent to, to get there backs up the evidence that we're getting from the stats. Yeah. So it's really highlighting them, them runs in beyond, isn't it? Um, setting up their yeah. patterns of creating overloads out wide. Yeah. Um, so they were was, they was some of the key key messages that you mm. spoke about. Um, and then actually you're going to sort of simulate that in terms of how you take it on into practice design to, to give the players opportunity um, to develop those characteristics. Yeah, so what, so what we did was um, we wanted to think, well, okay, looking at those runs, how do, how do we create those opportunities in, in training? And again, trying to link it into the fact that well, we know not everyone has a full pitch and I'm coming up with some practice designs and ideas that enables you to, to really think about these. And again, it's not probably anything that coaches that are on this webinar haven't seen before, but actually what we really want to think about is the detail that, that we're linking to this. So, you know, based on a, on a 16 player squad and, and splitting it into two games so that everyone's involved. And again, how you rotate your teams and the amount that they play in these, these small sided games are entirely down to your environment. But the idea here was to create an end zone game um, and, and make sure that what we're focusing on is how we can make combinations, but eventually get to the point where one of the blues or in the opposite direction, one of the yellows actually times their run and, and meets the ball at the same time in the end zone. So looking back at some of the, the telestrations that you've done, we've seen Weir and Mewis and, and others drive into that box or beyond the winger and and met the ball as, it, as it's reached there. And it's a two-directional game. So again, as, as they're they're defending they're then thinking if we win it how do we then create those very quick transitions of combination plays third player runs breaking lines and getting beyond the final defender to to provide opportunities to either shoot or cross depending where where they're receiving the ball um so you know a squad practice two games everyone's involved so we we the, the importance of the coaching here is as a coaching team is to make sure that we really emphasise what we're going after here and, and what we're trying to achieve from, from this kind of game. And linking back to what Jenna said in terms of the, the role of the coach is also how do we motivate and inspire them to make runs? Because as some of you said, there's, there are plenty of times in that game where runs were made and the player never got the ball. So games like this is also about that intention to make runs, knowing that you may not even get the ball as you run into the end zone. And if you just move it on that, you know, we'll, we'll break it down into a little bit more detail now. Yeah, so re really clear message for me. It was in the areas of pitch where it happens in the game. So it's realistic to that. Um, we're just going to touch on sort of, um, how you challenge the individual and the team within it. Um, Phil Hausman's um, sort of asked, is it a, a one way that fits most strategy um, to try and touch on different learning styles and cater for for the variance within your squad. Um, and I know you'll sort of bring that to life in the four corner model here, Mark. Yeah, uh, again, I think the key thing with any practice design is to to make it realistic to the game. And again, Matt, as you alluded to there, is trying to put it on an area of the pitch, first of all, that is relevant to what you're trying to achieve. And again, thinking about the physical loading as well, we want to make sure that the pitch size is appropriate but also we want to make it challenging and make it that you're they're going to have to run the distances in the game. So we want them to, to recognise what that might look like in practice as well. And again, you know, just just linking in the, the four corner model that we talk about and, and the impact that focusing on the individual. Um, again, not everyone is going to run in behind, but actually the detail of the receiver and, and the pass is, has got to be right to make sure that the ball and the player arrive in the, the end zone at the same time. So way to pass links into then your receiving skills and the creativity of how you're going to put that ball into the end zone. But also it then, when we think of the social corner and we talk about teamwork and communications, how do, how do you build those partnerships and how do you, in this type of practice, really get your players to see um, – the movements and some of the, the triggers and whether it's just the body shape or, or the timing of the run so that when we do get to, to games that they're all on the same wavelength and they're all thinking about 
the same things. And uh, I know, you know, when we look at the psychological corner, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more from, from a defending perspective later on, but there's got to be a link to the, the physical corner as well, that, that aggression in their running, that acceleration, that willingness to actually put in that yard, knowing that you may not get that ball, and then have that trust and confidence that next time it might come. And then and there's resilience built in there as well, isn't there? That it's, it's, it's trying. And I think Ellen White is probably a, a great example that for a while, you know, go back to the World Cup, there was, there was times where probably she never felt she was going to score a goal. Then all of a sudden, a bit of confidence and still running into those areas. And, and all of a sudden, she's putting the ball in the back on a regular basis for England in, in that six yard and that second six yard box. Um, and again, just just sort of progressions and thinking about how you build it up until we move into a bigger practice is just, there was a couple of examples you showed them, Matt, around the ball going in and then going backwards for the third player run to then running behind. And again, there's something that building connections between a number nine and a number 10 and then an, uh, a winger or, a, or another central midfielder running behind can, can really emphasise what you're trying to achieve. And then taking it on even further of actually linking it in with the area of getting crosses or shots off in the main goal in the centre of the pitch. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, Macaulay Bishops uh, said that he, he loves the fact that you can work on players' sides so he, it can make it um, in this practice that the left-sided players can, can join in this side and looking at the, the right side of your defence. You can you can target your players' um, yeah. individual needs within that. Yeah, yeah. Colin, you've read our mind. So and then, Matt, if you want to move on to the next slide. So again, you know, in terms of that, idea and 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 as you say macaulay said about making it specific about the individuals the next phase is obviously then to build it up of what does it look like in in a whole game or a, a phase of play in terms of half pitch three quarter pitch however you you would perceive that in terms of distances but again here now probably one of the key things about getting into lane two and four is that if it is across how many players do we then get in to the box and Obviously, the opposite winger is something, in this example, it would be the blue 11, is right. what is the role of her in terms of getting around the back post and making sure that sustained play? Because, again, I think something that we're really focused on in coaching is that often, still within the women's game, when phase one of a finish the attack happens, often the ball is transferred and it, it moves away from the goal. However, getting players connected and maybe trying to be able to sustain the the attack if the ball doesn't go in or or we keep possession is how do we have players that are in positions that can regain and then move the ball quickly into an, uh, an attacking area so we can't also forget in this this point here is as we're starting to build this and making it more game specific linked to to what we saw in there is that we also have to have security behind the ball so here we can start to talk about um, what is the role of the four once the ball has, has transitioned into the final third? What what does the opposite fullback do? Do they do they connect inside and, and do they just make sure there's a real solidness that if the ball is transitioned and they have to defend that we have good good positions on the pitch? And That's I think great. I don't I was just going to say, Sorry, great. in terms of the, the sort of formation, we, we base this on Manchester City. But however, you know, this is the thing with, with showing practices. What we've got to think about is actually taking the messages and making it relevant to your environment and the formations and the players that you have. But it's the principles that we're trying to achieve here of getting the balls into lanes two and four that we're really trying to stress here. Yeah, there's some, there's some great comments in the chat about uh, Dan. Dan's helping Chris in terms of how you take this um, into youth football and, and within a variety of environments. So um, it's really clear messaging and principle based. Uh, what the needs of your players for this moment, Jenna? Yeah. Any observation yeah. from you? A really good point around the pitch size. So if you're working five aside, you can still get some of the principles out, but the pitch would obviously be a lot smaller, and therefore the area that you're working in for lanes two and four would be smaller. Um, the language that you use would also be key, uh, working with younger players on what that 
what that looks like and what they understand or what they think they understand of the language that you use. Um, but in Mark's first practice, you could do lower numbers. So it might be 2v2 or 3v3, or you might have 5v5 and use the whole of your squad to go through that practice and put some conditions on. So if you receive with your back to goal, then you have to set it for somebody else and then make a move forward. So you can still ask them to do the same things, but it might take a little bit longer to get there. And you might have to really simplify some of the things that you ask them to do. Yeah. And I, and I think on that, Jenna, is that we, we've we rounded up a, a million one things that you could focus on in, in, a, in a practice here. And, and actually, you could play these kind of games week in, week out, but just change the tone and, and, and what it is you're actually going after with your individuals. And, you know, we use regularly the within the Lionesses pathway and, and within the RTCs this look forward, play forward idea and and as you said just for the younger age just keep the terminology and the clarity of what you're trying to achieve in each practice really simple and, and not try and do everything um we shouldn't, certainly wouldn't try to do all of the bullet points they're in the, the four corner they're all in one session it would it would flow over weeks maybe even months maybe even years in terms of trying to get all of this information into players i'm just going to uh, play the two uh, clips again just now we've had this discussion mm. or do you see um, how does your observation change um, and, and ultimately how would you work with your players on some of these principles that we just discussed so i mean although this didn't come to anything in terms of but actually what we've what we've tried to highlight is how that dynamic running and that getting beyond players at times has a real impact on on how manchester city play it's that intention, isn't it? Tension to run beyond, tension to, to flatten the defensive line, stretch them, um, and really be positive to drive forward. I think, Colin, just on your on your point now, I think it's a blend. I think one, knowing your players and, and what they need at that time. Um, I think it comes down to also the experience of the players. And I think when you're trying to build principles that uh, I wouldn't want it to be too designed for position specific but if you're building a principle of play that is you are trying to get people to run beyond the ball and run into areas then it doesn't have to be position specific however if your centre half is constantly running into gaps beyond your your centre forward then you might start to question your, your practice design and whether you start have to build in some position specific relevance to it but as a context for younger players I think one of the challenges that even at national level in conversations that we had is how do we create players? And Kira Walsh is probably a great example. And, and I know she's reaped huge praise over the last couple of weeks of how her positivity to now try and break lines um, where at times she's potentially gone side to side with her pass and been very safe. But that risk and then that challenge to try and break lines and, and make four passes has been linked to seeing players like Ellen White or... Lavelle and, and people actually making runs where she can see the pass through the lines into the zones two and four. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, we're not forgetting Everton in all of this. Um, and we're not forgetting defending and the value of good defending. Um, so now we're gonna we're now gonna look at the importance of the low block and actually fill in the box. Um, we spoke about this on the previous webinar, so I'm just gonna play some some footage that we can speak through. So this is this is Everton getting bodies in the way. Um, So again, populate the chat, observations, what do you see, and how do they do it?
So there, there's some aspects that happen in the game. And we're going to delve into the, the detail now um, in terms of that low block. So a principle we discussed um, on the last webinar was this, this uh, shot packing. So if you, if you draw a triangle from um, where the ball's struck from um, to both posts, to how many players um, from a defensive point of view are in the way um, so can actually stop that shot. So in this case, it's three. And the player on the, the right-hand side of, of Chloe Kelly uh, isn't uh, interfering with the play, so she's not deemed within that, within that triangle, but the other three are that could apply pressure on that. So that would be a shot packing number of three. Um, and why that's really important is, as we move on into the data, that um, we showed that only 25% of goals are scored with, with three or more players within that, um, within that goal frame. So actually, the more players um, you can get in the way, the better chance you have of uh, um, stopping shots and keeping clean sheets. So this was this was data taken from the, the whole of WSL last season. So that was a key message um, within our out of possession webinar. And also, more importantly, um, actually delaying the opposition between allowing them to make more touches. Um, so as you see in this graphic, the more touches you make, um, the more players then that can get in the way of the shot. So actually, um, the average number of players in the way was, was just under two. But if you make the opposition have more than three touches, then you can increase that. So it was about trying to actually fill the frame, uh, be in good spaces to, to block the shot and actually um, slow the opposition down. Mm. Mark, I love we can have 1.8 players in the way of the ball, Matt. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> so, uh, this is this is great. So this is um, back to the data point, isn't it? So yeah. how would you present this to your players? Um, how would you sell them the, the principle of we need to get um, so many players in the way? But more importantly, um, it's not just about the number. It's actually what you do, um, mm. what spaces you fill and how you affect the opposition. Um, so it could just be key messages in terms of delay, slow them down, fill the frame effectively and I will do an individual role within that. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. And I think you're going to show a couple of clips again here, aren't you, in terms of just how, you know, it was probably a really clear game plan. I think probably really recognised that the quality and the passing and movement of Manchester City was, was going to be something that really challenged them. So we really focused these players in the build-up to, to make sure that whenever the ball was in and around the, the box that... They did their very best to make sure that they, they really condensed the space. And, and as you, you said, forced Manchester City to have more touches on the ball, which again, linking it to stats that you talked about, is really reduces the opportunities and, and the, 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 the amount of times that goals are scored. And, you know, I think there's it comes back to the slide that Jenna talked and we talked about in terms of motivating your players to do that. What What is the motivation to to put your body in the way and, and, and really be aware of the movements of your, your teammates, but also making sure that we compact the area. And again, you just look at that straight away in terms of where that shot's been taken from. We've got one, two, three, four um, potential players that are impacting between the goal and the goalkeeper. And then therefore it, it becomes more of a, a challenge to score, doesn't it? For sure, for sure. And there's there's nine players, including the goalkeeper, in that frame. Yes. So, um, and, I, and I suppose the thing with this is the the challenge is how do you then get down the end of the pitch to to transition into if if nine players are behind the ball? But you know, again, it, it just shows then when we go back to the statistics and we move into how important set plays and corners can be if this is one of your strategies and principles that you're trying to to stop the opposition from scoring by. So that was our observations in terms of the low block. Um, now there's a bit of, of chaos. So when it's not as organised, when you can't structure it um, and the block gets broken, actually um, what happens in terms of that emergency defending. Um, so again, we've got some clips just to, to pose some thinking. Um, and then we'll, we'll delve into the detail afterwards. Come on, with a bit in the chat, foul or, or no foul? <laughs> yeah, we'll put a replay in just to uh, yeah, question the referee if you're on that side of the fence.
I know what my answer is. <laughs> I think this, this one clears it up, doesn't it? Oh, there's some responses coming in. Yeah. So again, you see Sandy McIver, player of the match, saving the team that sort of bravery to just to stop the ball going in the goal. Amy, I agree with you. <laughs> it's never been a yellow card, let's put it that way. <laughs> So again, uh, we're going to go into more detail in here, but I think what the the videos are highlighting is that that desire and that that energy to to again get your body in the way, the desire and, and energy to sort of commit to something there where you're, you're hopefully going to save a goal. There, you think clear goal. Um, and Meg Finnegan comes out of nowhere and, and saves the day. Yeah, just tap it in. Great defender. Um, so now we're, we're trying to unpack some of, of this um, in terms of how do you develop these characteristics within your players. Um, so just some stills in terms of desire um, to stop shots, get in the way, uh, fill good areas here um, so you're not blocking the same liners. As, you, as your teammate, you're actually filling the goal as much as possible. Um, so you can see that on, on Chloe Kelly's shot, and then here again with Georgia Stanway. Um, if he's on target, it's, it's hitting one of the, the Everton players. You like. So that in terms of just not numbers, but actually what role are you doing as well? And obviously this is being made harder at the moment, isn't it, in terms of the handball rule, in terms of players committing to how they present themselves in front of shots and, and, and areas on within the penalty area. Yeah. One of the key questions was about this uh, defending. I know, Jenna, you spoke about this, this psychological element. So we're going to delve into that. Yeah, so there's, um, there's a saying, play like it's a, a cup final which this game actually was, um, does, that, does that enhance the desire to want to win? Because you have to win that game to stay in the competition or in this case to win the competition. Or how do you as, as coaches build that into your players? Um, and it can be from a young age, but what does that look like for under 10s to try and help them to build their desire and their want to win and their motivation and bravery? Um you know, protecting the goal first? Do they have the motivation to stop being scored against to then go and score a goal? Um, so it's important that we think on, on co as coaches on how we start to build that from a younger age so it doesn't suddenly go, um, it doesn't suddenly go from un under 16s or adults up to, um, to then go, right, we really want to win. And, um the challenge there, Jenna, is this, and, and again, we could probably talk all day about this, this idea about this intrinsic motivation to, to winning and winning in a way is being your best and doing the best for yourself linked to actually the result and, and the game that's, that's in, that you're involved in. And for coaches, I think one of the things that we're trying to get across here is that when you see some of the clips that we shared this evening is there's a real desire to to really get their bodies in the way that, that they've really tried their best to make sure that the ball doesn't go in the, in the goal but as you said in in training how do we how do we get that desire how do we get that energy and, and what sort of practices can we do you know on on the field but also things off the field to encourage the commitment and energy to to win that ball at all Yeah, I think it's I mean, um, building into the consequences. So when you when you don't make that tackle and they score a goal, what what are the consequences of that? So in your training practices, um, when you play matches, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. So is it the last ten minutes of training where you go right? We're going to play a game, and then mm -hmm. a team loses because they're just all stood up the top end of the pitch because they all want to score a goal. So yeah. what's the consequence of that? And how do we turn that into a into something we can take onto a match day? 
Yeah, and I, and I think that's the importance. I think it doesn't matter what, what age group you're working with, right, from the youngsters all the way up to the seniors, that keeping scores and keeping um, results linked to, to what you were trying to achieve in training is really important to players. And we can't move away from the fact that, like you say, at the end of a session of just turning up and playing a game um, and letting it phase out is is something, yeah, there's times where we do that, but actually making sure we still keep some kind of competitive edge so that the, that last minute goal doesn't go in, which wins you the game. And and trying to drive anything that we do to have a meaning. And as you said, and, and to sort of tie it back to play like it's a cup final. Have that that intensity and meaning to to do that. Jenna obviously didn't like something I said there. <laughs> I think the gremlins are back. Um, we'll, we'll get, yeah. get Jenna back. But, I was just but, but I mean to tie that up, Matt. Just tie that bit up. You know the psychological impact of trying to um, defend and and having that desire. It is. It does. Although we have a four corner model, it does underpin the others. Because if you don't have that commitment and that bravery, are you going to go in with the physical prowess to to make sure that you do win the ball? Have you got that desire and energy to to make the tackle and, and have the right technique to know the timing to make that tackle? And the impact it has on the team and then that, that desire and that no fear and that motivation will players feed off of that and if they see you putting that energy effort into that last ditch tackle um, then it will drive and spur them on to do that as well so and then you know you talk about the two managers in there that the sort of behaviors and again speaking having spoken to Esme Morgan about this the way that they motivate and encourage is very individual and it's very what's right for that player and the sort of one of the last things to think about and this is the way that you interact with your individual players in your teams will be very different when it comes to the psychological side and you have to be fully aware of what is the best way to work with each individual player. Yeah, for sure. And that was one of the the, the key messages from the Esme Morgan interview, wasn't it, in terms of this intrinsic motivation. Um, yeah. Just to, be, just to be better than the direct competition, um, to be better than my mate at training and be better than the opposition um, when I'm in a game. And it's just that sort of, um, how do you breed that competitive edge um, in your culture, in your environment, um, with the behaviours that you set as a coach? And it's back to that, um, yeah, that, that massive role that you've got as a coach to be that positive influence. Yeah, and then I think the, the important part is knowing when to dial it up and dial it down and, and again, what that means for individuals. And, and for Esme, it was very much, she almost needed um, reeling in at times because her own intrinsic motivation and energy to do everything as best as she could sometimes were detrimental to her learning, whereas other players will be the opposite, that you need to really work hard with them and, and challenge them in ways and, and put them in positions that's really going to take them out of their comfort zone. But you can only do that if you know your individual player. And then that's how it all links together, isn't it, in terms of that? Um... There's, there's a few questions coming in. Mike Healy asks, would you give individual players challenges um, to keep the desire um, to keep the ball? Um, and how would you frame them up within the yeah. session? Yeah, again, I think, Mike, with that, I think, you know, individual challenges, everyone will work with IDPs in terms of, but actually just in individual sessions, just one-to-one -one challenges is, is a great way with, you know, any age group. But... It may be, well, let's take the practice that we talked about in terms of from a getting into lanes two and two and four. Actually, one of the challenges for the defenders is make sure that you work as hard as you can and you try and shut the opportunities for them to cross or shoot. And you do that as much and as hard as energy as you can. And it's, it's I think you can do that in every session. Um, linked to whatever your session outcome is on for both teams or you know however you set your practices up. Wonderful. Jenna, can you hear us? You back? Yeah, I'm um, back. Sorry. I'm going to come to you with a question. Um, in terms of Colin Reed's asked about bravery being hard to teach. Um, and actually often within a game situation, um, part of our analysis was about outnumbered. Um, so how do you how do you teach some of them um, characteristics where you've You've got less players, uh, but you've still got to come out on top. Yeah, I think um, I think it's a byproduct of that desire 
to want to win that individual challenge. So it's giving the players challenges um, that they have an opportunity to win rather than necessarily winning the game. So it might go back into the individual challenges that you were just talking about. Can you give players an individual challenge to make so many tackles within a three minute block within a game? So again, constraints led. Um, but I think bravery comes as a, a byproduct rather than something that you'll actually teach within the game. Brilliant. Wonderful. Um, perfectly on time. Uh, few tech issues. Um, yeah, just like it was planned. Um, I hope you've I hope you've taken a lot away from tonight. So hopefully we've we've given some key storylines um, from the, the Vitality Women's FA Cup final. Um, we've hopefully dripped some some themes about what considerations coaches need to um, take within their training um, in terms of how do they take meaningful interventions from the game into that into that training pitch and then actually um, how do they empower their players in terms of practice design and bring about them them interventions with the individual and team aspects. Any any final points before I wrap up, Mark and Jen? No, just first of all, thank you for everyone that's joined us this evening. I mean, it's been a really interesting again to analyse the game and, and watch it over a few times and and again, just just sort of get that coaching brain working and thinking of what it means for for me personally in terms of how you present those practices and how you get those messages across your players. And that's the big encouragement off the back of this is make sure whatever you're trying to achieve for your 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 practice design is linked to what you're doing in games and and your coaching and your playing philosophy and and do your best to make the practices real to what you're trying to achieve on a Saturday or Sunday when you get the opportunity to play again. Wonderful. Um, I'm just going to finish with the support um, for the women's and girls game. Um, something we've been, we've been really clear that we wanted to present on, on all the webinars in terms of the ongoing support. Um, contacts available on the, on the, the boot room um, and there were some bespoke stuff done within our webinars. So we just wanted to make that really clear that there is support available. Please use it um, as much as possible. And I know we all, we're all the same. We can't wait to, to help people when we can actually get out there and, and on the grass um, on training and match day with people. So all that's left me to say is a huge thank you to Mark, to Jenna, and to everyone that's tuned in. Um, stay safe and well. Um, please, please look out uh, for any future webinars on the FA Learning. Um, this will go up tomorrow. So the ones that are asking about um, this being recorded, so the full recording will go up there um, to complete the four-part series. Um, and we look forward to, to watching the Women's FA Cup final again this season. Um, we, get two, we get two in the same calendar year. It's perfect. Yeah. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank Thanks, Jenna. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.